Hi, my name is Joe Cernick, and I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University, and I'd like to welcome you to Insight. Now, Insight is a show where we normally discuss books on uh, politics, both domestically and internationally. Uh, sometimes we talk about historical books that provide some insight into the present or some broader trend analysis books that provide you a way of seeing certain developments. Um, this is a book that is perhaps addressing international affairs. Uh, it's called Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control, written by Media Benjamin. And uh, joining me on the panel today are three Lindenwood University students. Uh, Bailey Bauer is to my immediate right. Lucas Walker is to uh, her right. And Alexander File is to uh, his right. Now, uh, while we're discussing this particular book, Media Benjamin, Drone Warfare Killing by Remote Control, um, uh, Lucas has read another book which we're going to use as sort of a complementary and contrast which is also called Drone Warfare written by John Keg and Sarah Kreps and so uh, you'll get a sense of if this is of interest to you to read two books uh, that address the same issue. Now I wanted to read an opening quote from the, the Benjamin book uh, and get you a sense of where the author is coming from. Uh, the author writes the technology for flying remotely held vehicles has existed for decades. Unmanned aerial vehicles were first tested by the military way back during World War I. The prototype for the most popular killer drone, the Predator, was developed in the 1980s. The Predator drone was born and used in the Balkan Wars to gather information on refugee flows and Serbian air defenses. It was not until 1999, during the NATO Kosovo campaign, however, that someone came up with the idea of equipping these planes with missiles, transforming them from spy planes to killer drones. However, it was the 9-11 World Trade Center attacks that led to an explosion in the U.S. military's use of drones and a host of other robotic weapons. Like you explained, the book starts with a timeline of back in World War I and 1980s where drones were just merely surveillance, but then since 1999 they have equipped them with missiles. Although production rates were high in 19, uh, after 9-11, most were still only used for surveillance. But now, building drones are common that the author even states anyone who wants to build them an unmanned aircraft can order the parts online and essentially create them in their own garage. Hmm. Uh, my book really addressed the implications of drones as opposed to um, like the actual product. Um, it talked about how um, countries can go about using them legally um, in other countries' airspace, and whether they're in combat zones or not, um, the international relations, um, how different countries view how we use drones and how they will use drones against us as well. Um, the authors really address that drones have become um, an essential part of military action in different countries. It takes many Americans out of uh, line of fire, so they perceive that as a benefit, but also realize that there are um, different things that could hurt America. Most drones, whenever like the stigma about them is they are just for reconnaissance, but this book addresses it's not only used for reconnaissance, they are also used to drop in bombs and other kinds of weaponry that keep us out of the action and it helps. Uh, there's a quote in uh, the Benjamin book and uh, it's written, it says, Inside Afghanistan I saw more lives destroyed by U.S. bombs. Some bombs hit the right target but caused terrific collateral damage. Some bombs hit the wrong target because of human error, machine malfunction, or faulty information. In one village, the Americans thought a wedding party was a Taliban gathering. One minute, 43 relatives were joyously celebrating. The next minute, their appendages were hanging off the limbs of trees. Forty villagers were killed in another small town in the middle of the night. Their crime they lived near the caves of Tora Bora, where Obama, uh, Osama bin Laden was presumed to be hiding. 
The U.S. news media reported the dead as Taliban militants, but a woman I met who had just lost her husband and four children, as well as both of her legs, had never heard of Al-Qaeda, America, or George Bush. That would be the main problem of drone warfare that has been established in this book, is that they malfunction and they do crash a lot. It even quotes that excessively high losses of aircraft can negate cost advantages by requiring the services to purchase large numbers of replacement aircraft. So not only is it endangering lives, but it's also wasting uh, thousands of dollars. And even crashes like President Kennedy's brother died in a secret drone operations with um, the Germans. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the main points that uh, the book that I read addresses, is the implications of a wrongful attack, um, what we do in the aftermath, how we spin it in America. And it was actually hidden um, for the first few years of Obama's presidency. They, they didn't let um, the populace know that they were actually carrying out drone attacks. They wanted to keep those, um, you know, hidden from the public eye. Mm. Not only are drones dangerous in the courses of crashing, but also who we select as targets. Um, they don't really disclose who is and who isn't a target and the criteria of which makes them a target so there could potentially be wrongful attacks because of this. Hmm. And another thing is drone warfare is supported by both Republicans and Democrats with Republicans having 83% approval rate with Democrats also having a 79% approval rate within the book. So across yeah. the board bipartisan support for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like he was saying, picking their targets, um, they had a thing called Terror Tuesdays where they said basically a president had weekly meetings and they would just put certain people on the kill list, not having a certain criteria just who they thought on that day. Hmm. Yeah, I remember that part in the book. And uh, he, she, it was mentioned, but it wasn't sort of developed well about how these uh, targets came about. Uh, I guess uh, we're assuming, I guess, that information from intelligence sources must have identified who, who you should be going after, which still means you've got to go find them. Right. And so uh, in the book, uh, it was mentioning, I must admit that when I walked down the streets of Baghdad a few months after the invasion, I marveled at the selective destruction of these weapons. Block after block, I saw one building reduced to rubble while the building right next door was still standing tall. And so goes on to the precision of these uh, weapons. Yeah, when, when drones were weaponized, um, that uh, raised the question of how to regulate them. Um, as we can see, there's destruction everywhere from them, um, killing innocent people, actually killing top Al-Qaeda and Taliban leaders. Um, what we really need to do is have um, the debate and really figure out how to make these things um, to where they're accurate, they don't malfunction, um, and that they just overall perform to the way we want them to. Mm. Right. In uh, 2009, more than one-third of them had crashed. In 2010, 38 lost during combat mm. and nine crashed in training. Altogether, 79 drone um, accidents and this would be engine failure, somebody pushing the wrong button. It, they described a story that the Navy has a self-destruct feature if the pilot presses the space bar, which did happen in one occasion where he accidentally hit the space bar and then it blew up in an area that they did not really want an attack to happen. Another problem with drones is apparently Iran claimed to have crashed one of our drones by disrupting its GPS signal. The U.S. claimed that it was technical problems, but do we really know if that's the real truth or maybe they have figured out a way to disrupt these drones, which could potentially be dangerous to civilians as well as ourselves? Yeah, I uh, was wondering, because you know, they mentioned that in there and it's trying to figure out. I, I would assume that if they've got some remote control system, you should be able to jam it in some way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I mean, obviously you don't want to reveal that your weapons might have a weakness. Okay. So. And another one of those weaknesses is um, if these drones get into dogfights mm -hmm. with other, um, you know, enemies, you know, actual airplanes, they don't have the ability to uh, maneuver away from them, um, deter rockets or any other machine gun fire from hitting them. So that's another one of the uh, problems with drones and flying them in an actual like war zone. Yeah, and going off that, the basic weather can. Um, mm -hmm 
deter its accuracy, re reliability problems come with this, and this can just be from clouds, rain, fog. It doesn't have to be a security program with a, a virus or anything like that. It just could be simple rain. Um, and I think one of the things when I was reading the book about that is I, I suspect it's because you're going through different generations, and as you go through generations of drones, they probably become more sophisticated and are able to start to resolve some of these problems that you, you don't really think about at first, such as the weather uh, interference and actually what are they aiming at. And, and so as a result, you know, you're trying to correct some of that along the way. So I, I would suspect you're going to see even greater use of these in the future as they become uh, overcoming many of their uh, fault problems associated with flying or evasion or what they can see. I agree with that and another problem with drones is the personnel you need to require it. A standard F-16 fighter only needs less than 100 people in order to f get it fully operational. Whereas for example a Predator drone which takes 108 or 168 people per person or a Global Hawk drone which takes 300. And there's not just one of these drones, there's going to be multiple, so personnel will be a problem as well because it's hard to employ that many people to specifically work these drones. Yeah, that infrastructure, the number of personnel, when I read that, I was thinking there's another way you'd see the growth because then as you're bringing new people into, say, the Air Force, that over time you're going to then maybe expand the amount of people that are associated with that part of the service. And so for now, I'm assuming that you're not really thinking of it as a separate arm within the Air Force completely, but that over time you're going to see that as a track where people are only in drone warfare and then start to work their way up the line because they're going to be looking for uh, promotions. and. So you're going to have more of an infrastructure within the Air Force just associated with uh, drones. Right. There's not just growth in personnel and of aircrafts, but also of, um, money and revenue. In 1980, it, it was only $115 million, and it's gone up to $661.6 million reviews from the uh, 2010, 90% which came from the Pentagon. And even in 2000 to 2010, um, it sold more than 2.4 billion worth. So that's uh, a lot of aircraft um, money being spent on drones that we don't really necessarily have complete control over yet. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, weapon systems will, will, will become more, um, you know, AI based. Um, humans will have less of a, a factor, I guess, in. Um, in actual war, so I think uh, looking towards the future, the military will change, like you said, um, and become more, more based on robotics. Yeah, there was uh, this, and I'm thinking because they were talking about Lockheed Martin uh, back in 2012 was looking at how to refuel or recharge uh, a drone, and so this one was called the Stalker. And so as a result, you're having sort of uh, in-flight refueling to keep this drone uh, aloft. And so as a result, based on that, I'm assuming you have these uh, developments. There's another one called the Reaper, and that you started realizing that it can stay 18 hours uh, up there in the air. And so as a result, this endurance of how long you're going to have a flying drone uh, able to stay there and develop. It's the idea of the Predator went to the infrared camera so that you can uh, see a guy and the way they say it is you can even watch him go to the bathroom. And so as a result, you know, what you can see from a distance of, and this is interesting, you're up 10,000 feet and you're able to uh, see this and sort of follow him as he's sitting down having a conversation or lighting a cigarette. Yeah, with being 10,000 feet in the air and being able to see all of this intel f they are, for so long, they, these drones have 18 hours worth of battery life. They don't have the problem of a pilot getting hungry or needing sleep, so they can continue on their mission for very long hours at a time before they have to be recharged. Mm. Yeah, it's saying from 8,000 8, miles away, an Afghan can be watched smoking and joking with friends completely, unaware that he's being watched by drones um, not too far away. And yeah, it has very extreme uh, long endurance, and you don't need... You don't have the problems with a pilot or somebody up there um, worried about their health. It's just a robot in the sky. And in, the book, in the book I read, they uh, address the domestic issue. 
on um, how the United States government and the CIA specifically are going to start using drones um, for surveillance for you know, maybe prison security, um, also on people of interest, um, whether that be the most wanted list, suspected drug dealers, uh, border agents already use them a lot. So we're really bringing them home as opposed to uh, far away. Yeah, there was uh, in the book we read called Gorgon Stare. And uh, it wasn't completely developed, but you, this thing here was, I guess, they're uh, taping uh, entire cities uh, what's going on and now you're sitting down and what the Air Force has done is they've designated certain Air National Guard squadrons to just look at uh, <coughs> these videos from Gorgon Stare of looking at a specific city to figure out what it is you're exactly looking at and so I, they're gathering so much information but that doesn't mean that just because you have all this information, you figure out what you exactly have in front of you. So now you've got to sort of sort through it to figure out what's uh, usable and what's not. Yeah, the Gorgon Stair had a cost of $15 million a piece. And um, it goes off the Greek, Greek mythology of whose blinking eyes turned to stone those who beheld him. And that's kind of what it went off of. It has multiple infrared and conventional cameras that um, heighten its capabilities. But the interesting fact, it's not operationally effective nor operationally suitable for uh, what we need it to do. And for $15 million to have a toy that doesn't work is not exactly productive by any means. Well, I mean, they talk about the uh, number of uh, drones that crash, and it looks like, uh, if you're looking at these figures, it seems like more than a third of them. Mm -hmm. So I am assuming, again, next generation technology will try to correct some of that problem. And so you're sitting there and looking at this idea of thinking, in this case, they were saying 2010, you had 38 uh, Predator and Reapers that were lost during combat operations and it seems like a high percentage of them were crashing because of malfunction although they are talking here about one of them that ran into a C-130 cargo plane and so the cargo plane had to land after that crash. These are expensive drones too so it's costing the United States government a lot that they could have lost somewhere else um, so I think that what they need to do is just take it back to the drawing board figure out a drone that's effective. Um, I mean, you can't work out all technological errors, but you have to be able to better something so that you're not, you know, just throwing away money. This here, I put, was another one. He said drones that go rogue, mm -hmm. which means you don't know exactly where they're flying around, and as a result, you lose control of them. So they were saying, so again, this is 2009, so we're going back. Uh, a period of years and so again I'm not sure whether there's been a correction because um, the author obviously couldn't keep up with maybe the next generation of some of these but mentioning that in 2009 the Air Force realized that uh, for example this one drone flying around with a payload of weapons and they didn't know where it was going so they just had to send up airplanes to shoot it down uh, and so this notion that that is, uh, seems to be a normal event uh, that occasionally they will just sort of go rogue is sort of a feature of what you're dealing with. Right, and the United States isn't the only one that's having problem with this, as you said in 2009 with the Air Force incident. In 2008, an Israeli decided to return to Ireland and crash en route um, to its location just by going rogue and not following the commands of the remote control. The one of the things that uh, she brings up in uh, the drone warfare killing by remote control book was the idea of, well, we say they're precise targeting. They may not necessarily be. And so they were saying one of the Air Force generals said that they were 95% accurate, which meant not completely. So that, that other 5%, you're trying to figure out where did it go and uh, what exactly went on. And so as a result, uh, you're looking at the idea that uh, they were saying they have something called double tap and that you're firing two Hellfire missiles at a target to increase the probability that you've hit the target you want. So now you're wondering, well, what else did you hit? Yeah, I think that that's, that's kind of crazy that, you know, the military would just try and 
throw enough stuff and hopefully something sticks. I think that um, that's just kind of wasteful. It brings um, the opportunity for the military to strike something that they weren't supposed to, um, which brings implications on an international scale. Um, I think that that's why drones used by the U.S. are so unfavorable. Um, it, in the Middle East, of all countries, um, they they say that only 7% of the people, the population in Afghanistan, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, where U.S. uses drones the most, is actually, those people actually favor them. So I think that they should find a way to better them so they don't have all these, these mistakes. Right, and the double tap actually puts more civilians in the line of fire because once one shot goes off, um, it's friend nearby is going to come over and help him and he might get shot in the process. So they're saying about 50 um, personnel were killed on the second shot when these double tap firings happened. The issue of this next generation, so they briefly bring this up uh, and talk about General Atomics as the company in California that seems to be very big into the production of these and the next generation is supposed to fly faster, be higher up, so less of a chance of seeing them. Now you're at uh, the vicinity of 60,000 feet up and that they're going to carry a bigger payload so that if you're going to carry this bigger payload you're more likely to have more collateral damage, hence a lot more civilians uh, being killed by them. One aspect of the new, of the next generation of drones is they're trying to make them more lightweight, um, so they weigh less. One of them weighs less than one-third of the Hellfire that they have currently, and they're deciding if smaller might be better. The uh, one of the things I thought, um, she didn't really develop the implications of it, but was saying that uh, now you're starting to sell to Middle Eastern and South Asian countries, and that previously there was sort of a restriction on sale to NATO countries and a few other countries, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, but now that you're selling to the Middle East and South Asia, then you're wondering how many of these are going to be used essentially eventually by terrorist organizations, and there's some reference to the possibility that uh, they might get their hands on some of them and start to use them. So the implications of uh, where the future takes us is not quite clear there. It really shows just how much of a demand for drones are these days. It's estimated that $94 billion is going to be spent on it between 2011 and 2020. And General Atomics is getting the biggest benefit out of it as they have sold $2.4 billion worth of equipment to the U.S. government alone. And they are also spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawyers for overseas in order to get their drones to be sold to non-NATO countries as well, like you said earlier. Yeah, there's this reference to something called Switchblade, which sounds like a kamikaze uh, drone. And so essentially this is the concern that a terrorist organization doesn't need to necessarily shoot a missile as much as aim the missile. Uh, or the drone and that as a result use it as a, a weapon that way. So you're trying to figure out you know, is this a possibility and I, I, somewhere along the line they do talk about some of this stuff is that the switchblade is only five and a half pounds so that it's obviously small enough that you can uh, transport it around before you send it up in the air there. Uh, I thought there was another section in here which I thought was interesting. She was visiting Afghanistan and talking about how people are developing depression because they know the drones are up there and being used against them and in the process of being used against them that they're unable to come together now to meet because they're worried about by coming together to have any sort of social meeting or a, a meeting of any sort they may be seen of as a Taliban organization and worry about being targeted. On the international scale um, we need to work on that on uh, working on the intel we receive and use um, we need to make sure that we are almost 100% accurate. We are um, for sure that this group that we see um, is actually supposed to be a target as opposed to just civilians because the civilian casualties are what really um, gets America in trouble. It was interesting that uh, one of the concerns that the United States had in the Bush administration leading up to the Iraq war was uh, that uh, Iraq, then under Saddam Hussein, had drones 
and that he was preparing to use them against the West by delivering chemical and biological weapons with these drones. And so uh, this was later debunked, but nevertheless, the concept of feeling that your enemy have drones and or will get them seems to be still uh, an issue that the book sort of brings up. Yeah, um, in the, after the 9-11 attacks, there were a very high amount of strikes in Pakistan going up to 350. And some would say this is out of control, killing over 2,600 to 3,400 people just with uh, drones in the air. We only have a few minutes left, so what do you think of this book and your book? And two out of three read the same book. Uh, well, they need to be limited and we need to make sure that we have the, the right intel. Uh, we can't just have millions of drones in the sky watching all of the other countries 24-7. Um, we need to pick our targets and um, really focus on one person, not just surveillancing everybody. Um, I like my book because it went over more of the uh, consequences of using drones as opposed to the nuts and bolts part. Um, one of my favorite quotes from the book was actually, um, one of the reasons why our technological capabilities outpace our understanding of them is the widespread belief that technological advancement is itself synonymous with progress and therefore does not need to be regulated. Simply put, it is the assumption that technological advancement is necessarily good. So I like that they um, address these issues on the consequences of using drones throughout their book um, on the international scale, on a domestic scale. Um, I think that if you want to um, understand um, the implications of drones, I think this would be a good book. Mm -hmm. I agree this was a good book simply because it stated the problems that are associated with drones and it stated in a clear way in which it's up for us, the readers, to decide how we should determine it. So I would recommend it to be a good read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, the Benjamin book, the one that uh, I read the quote from, uh, it's an easy readable book uh, and I think taken together both books would give you some great insight into drone warfare and since it's going to be obviously growing in importance in the future that I, I think uh, both books together are useful. I thought it was interesting uh, they start to have uh, big concerns about collateral damage because uh, the CIA seemed like it had an enormous amount of involvement in determining the targets and the State Department has to then step in and you're trying to work out some differences and the book is ending with the Obama administration so we're, we don't really have any insight with the Trump administration but nevertheless that the uh, State Department and the CIA had to sort of then now begin to try to work together uh, because State Department was concerned about the repercussions of the enormous amount of collateral damage, hence uh, killing of civilians, and uh, they were trying to resolve some of that. And so uh, I think both books together would give you a good insight, uh, readable, and you can get through them. So thank you for joining us today.